Hello. Hi. Death to cookies. There, over the centuries, mankind has come up with all different kinds of cookies. Though, I'm not talking about those delicious cookies. I'm talking about the cookies that you have in your web browser. And, of course, why should they die? Because of evil hackers. Set the stage for our main characters. Alice and Bob. <laughs> Alice and Bob have a long distance relationship. Not only that, they both share a passion for cookies. Alice has all the secret recipes and Bob is not only good at building, he's also really good at baking, but he needs those recipes and he needs them as quickly as possible because they want to open a cookie store. How does Alice get the recipes to Bob? She could tell them over the phone, that might be tedious, and that's where we come in. We are web developers. We smell a business niche. We create our own web platform, Recipe-tastic. We hire a designer who does an amazing job to end up with our first product. <laughs> this website, this web application, Web 2.0, allows Alice to retrieve them and greet them. Now there's a problem. There are two people that want to do evil. The first of them is Eve. Eve wants to get her hands on the recipes and sell those delicious cookies herself. And the other one is Mallet. Mallet is even worse. Mallet tries to modify the recipes so that Bob will include poison all of his friends and customers will die. So how do we solve this? Because right now they can't use our application due to security reasons. Well, there's a pretty easy solution that we'll just put up a login box up there and the problem is solved. Turns out it's not that easy because we actually have to implement the login logic in the back end. But as experienced web developers, we quickly know what to do with this. We choose cookies. When I say cookies, this also applies to using the session in, in uh, Rails or Sinatra because at one point or another, this will use a cookie. Now, when Bob logs in, this will send an HTTP request, a post request that in the body contains the email and the password he entered. And then with the response that the server sends, will include a set cookie header. We can do that when we build it this way. That just says, sets the cookie called user to the value Bob. And now whenever Bob's web browser triggers a new request, it will include the cookie header that, that has user equals Bob in there. And now we know it's Bob. Now we know we can show him the recipes. Oh, we know it's Alice and she may edit those recipes. But this actually opens us up to the first attack, which is just basically just guessing. Eve could go on and just guess the cookie value for Bob, looking maybe at her own value and seeing, oh, it's user equals Eve. Gosh, I wonder what it is for Bob. <laughs> Moreover, Mallet could do the same thing with Alice, and this makes us a sad cookie. How do we solve this? We have to solve this security issue. Well, here's an easy fix. How about we include another header where we store the password? <laughs> that would mean Eve would have to guess uh, Bob's password, but then she also should, could just log in on the website. Then now uh, with every request, we get the password and congratulations. You just implemented basic auth on top of cookies. And you've been all laughing mainly because, ha <laughs> password in the cookie. But 
You could also obviously use a token to not have the plain text password in there, and that would solve this attack. Well, now it's getting more fancy, and I guess you all know this attack. It's a, a cross-site scripting attack. It's pretty straightforward, but I still should cover it because if you don't know this attack, then I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't call yourself web developer. Or you should really think about it. So whenever you have user input, people could just enter some HTML, like loading a script from evilhexor.com. And then when someone looks at the page generated from this user input, that script will be executed. And that script can read, cook it can read the cookie and just send it to somewhere. Well, to fix this, we can set the cookie to HTTP only, which will make it so that JavaScript cannot see this cookie. But then, if you're in the situation where you can execute JavaScript in the website, then you can also, with that JavaScript, just read and write recipes. How do you solve this? Well, first of all, what also Rails is actually doing for you, but what you should always, always, always keep in mind is sanitize all user input. Anything user input cannot be trusted. And another thing that I highly encourage you to look into is the content security policy, which allows you to set a CSP header that specifies which kinds of JavaScript, where like inline JavaScript, can it be executed? JavaScript from this domain, can it be executed? And so on. Getting fancier. I assume a lot of people knew about CSS here. Uh, you guys know about CSRF? Heard about it? Probably, yes. So it's where Eve now would set up, or Mallet would set up a decoy website and sends the link to Bob or Alice and says, hey, check this out. How long can you look at this website? And then in this website includes an image tag that, in this case, for instance, creates a new recipe. What can we do? This triggers a request that includes a cookie, and we have deadly cookies. Well, so one thing we can do is, instead of a get request, we can use a post request because an image tag will always only trigger a, a get request, maybe a head request, um, usually a get request, but it will, an image tag will never trigger a post request in the form we just set method to post, problem solved. Though it's actually not because that website could also include a hidden form and a hidden iframe because Melod has mad CSS skills. And that basically includes all that with a hard-coded content mixed flower with poison and everyone is dead. And then just use some JavaScript that triggers the request and we have deadly cookies. So what are we going to do about this? So HTTP gives us a few things that can help. One of them is a referrer header. And no, that is not my typo. That is in the HTTP standard. Referrer is supposed to have a second R there. And this header includes the URL that was visited before that request was triggered. And then in this example code that's in Sinatra, we could just check if the referrer starts with our current base URL, which is the origin. It's the schema, the host, and the uh, port if it's a non-standard port. And we're happy, problem solved, or so we think. The problem is FTP, HTTPS, do not trigger a referrer header because the assumption is that it could include confidential data. And moreover, if the user has an outdated Flash plugin installed that can just set an arbitrary referrer header, so we cannot trust it. To solve this, recent browsers introduced a header called or Origin that is just that base URL part so that you're not leaking confidential data from the URL. That even simplifies our code because we don't have to check start with, we have to check if it equals the origin. And in this code, I'm also checking for safe requests. I'm not sure if you can see this, request.safe question mark, because we don't want to block get requests, we don't want to block head requests, we don't want to block options requests. Problem solved, right? No, actually not, because it's not supported by all the browsers, and if your Flash plugin can override the referrer header, it can also override the origin header. So we cannot actually trust this. 
what we can do and what Rails, for instance, does, what REC protection, which is used by Sinatra, does, is use a CSRF token. So we set a CSRF token as a cookie or in a session. And then we also have a hidden field in, in the form that has the same token. And then if those two tokens don't match and it's not a safe request, then we simply refuse the request. And problem solved. Let's talk about this, this domain part. It's called the origin. And there is a thing called the same origin policy, which states that JSON can only be loaded from the same origin via AJAX. So imagine our website, since it's Web 2.0, loads our data via JSON and then uses, I don't know, Backbone to render it. And we might have an endpoint that has an array at top level. And that includes the recipe steps as strings in there. And now, you would assume that an attacker could just load that via AJAX, and the request coming from the same browser will have the cookie, and it could get the data. But no, as you're probably aware, there's a thing called same origin that prevents that. What an attacker could do to trigger such a request is included as a script, because JSON is a valid subset of JavaScript. Still seems harmless. It will be loaded because same origin doesn't g kick in here, but it's a get request. We are not changing any data. The attacker cannot read the array, so it seems harmless. But in JavaScript and older browsers, you can override the array constructor before loading that JavaScript. And I have an example back the, down here where you could then, when the new array is created, store the values somewhere. So that's not really secure. You can solve this by never serve JSON that has an array at top level. It's actually a valid solution. There are other solutions, but first let's talk about Internet Explorer. <laughs> Internet Explorer up until version 8 has this thing called VB script. Anyone remembers that? Turns out it didn't fully implement same origin. And under certain circumstances, you could just load JSON from other domains. Well, there is a really simple solution that I encourage everyone to use. <laughs> well, I'm, some people, for some people, it might not be an option to block old, out, uh, out old Internet Explorer versions. Uh, so one thing you can do is you can require a CSRF token for every AJAX request, including GET requests. And the problem is solved. So you think we're doing good so far? You th can we trust the cookie? Can we trust that it comes from us? Cookies are scoped by the domains. There's DNS cache poisoning, but I think that's not a super big threat anymore. It used to be. There is a thing called cookie tossing that GitHub suffered, suffered from. Moreover, can we trust the browser? I think generally, yes. I think the people that are behind Chrome, the people behind Firefox, there, and all those other browsers we love and hate. I think they at least have someone who knows a lot and probably more than I know about security. But can we trust browser plugins? So for instance, I had a plugin installed. It's called cloud to butt plus When you're on a website that says, somewhere in the text says cloud, it replaces it with butt. <laughs> and if it says, my, uh, the cloud, it replaces it with my butt. So get ready for the cloud becomes get ready for my butt. <laughs> cloud atlas becomes butt atlas. I disabled it when I got a faulty redirect for something that was supposed to be on CloudFront and I ended up on a porn site. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, this is JavaScript that is executed in all of the websites I load. And I have not reviewed this code. Do you review the code? No, I don't. So this is basically XSS. Well, we can use signed cookies. We can use encrypted cookies. That should secure our cookie, right? No, it actually doesn't. So it turns out there is a whole category of attacks similar to the CSRF attack, where you trigger a CSRF attack, and it has the cookie, and that's all that matters. You don't actually care what's in the cookie. You only know that that cookie very. Uh, you only need to know that that cookie verifies you're that person, and there's a similar kind of 
a group of attacks that's eavesdropping where encrypted cookies don't help. And so the thing is, if someone reads your network communication between the browser and your server, they can just parse out the cookie and use it. Seems kind of hard, like, how do you do that? How do I see the network stream? Well, for instance, if there is an open Wi-Fi, then you see all the network communication around you. And there is a Firefox plugin that monitors that open Wi-Fi. It's called FireSheep. And then gives you a list of accounts that are currently using the Wi-Fi and are logged in. And two years ago, this was three years ago, this was really big. I used it, it works like a charm. So the person that made a screenshot is not that guy. That guy was just on the same Wi-Fi and was using Facebook. And you get a list of names. You click on it. And you're locked in as that person. Now, that plugin currently does not support recipe testing. But with the hockey stick growth we, we are expecting, <laughs> it's just a matter of time, right? So how do you solve this? Luckily, and you're probably aware of this, like you can protect your Facebook account easily with this magic thing called SSL. Because with SSL, everything is encrypted. So the attacker cannot parse the cookie from the stream. Makes us really happy. Or can they? <laughs> there are a few attacks where they f I think they first come up with the name, and then they think about what it stands for. The, f the first one is Beast, I think. I'm not going to talk about that. But I'm going to talk about Crime, which was really big last year. Compression ratio info league made easy. So SSL encrypting, that really blows up your traffic because it becomes way longer. So SSL has built-in support for compression. And this can be abused. An attacker can trigger requests from the browser, say from awesomewebsite.com, where people stare at the nine cat move in. And just append, just trigger requests over requests over requests and append stuff to the URL. And the closer this string matches what's in the cookie, the better the cookie and that string will get compressed. So the better the compression gets for the same request, basically, except for the string, you know that you're getting closer and closer to the cookie. And if it's, at the end, not getting any better, you know you have the cookie, and voila. Well, there's an easy fix. Let's update your browser. Modern browsers simply do not take the uh, cookie into account when compressing. You can change the cookie on every response, which will basically annihilate the getting closer, getting closer. Or you can turn off SSL compression, which is also not a good solution. So people assume this is a, uh, a solved attack, but there's actually breach, which is like crime, but for the response. So you don't attack the cookie. You instead attack the CSRF token, and then you can run a CSRF attack again. And all you need is a web endpoint, like search, for instance, that repeats whatever is the random string you're appending, and then that will match up with the token in the source code, and that will compress better, and that's solved. But that's, that's still an open issue with websites. What you can do is you can append a random number of bytes to the response. You can mask the CSRF token differently, but I don't know if a lot of people that do either of them. But the problem is solved. Now, do you think about all this when you build your apps? Uh, apps? And I feel like the next attack vector is right around the corner. So what are alternatives? Well, you could authenticate by IP. Why are you not laughing? <laughs> like, this is a stupid idea. Like, IPs are changing. So different people use the same IP, so on. You could have the session ID and the URL. <laughs> yes. OK. We had that. PHP had that for a while. And then you copy the URL, and then you're locked in as someone else suddenly. What you can do, what we do, is we use a custom authorization header. This is some code from Travis CI where on every HTTP request from our client, we just set that header. And that, that way, attacker cannot trigger a request that will include the same header. And so that in local storage. The big downside is it needs JavaScript. Works really well with Turbolinks. But it's not a real solution. I actually think that it's time to talk about new browser concepts. I'm not too sure what they look like, but I think 
that we really need to move away from using cookies for authentication and if it's just for getting recipe testing safe. Thank you.